have you, have you seen, I'm sure many of you have, in the last couple of weeks there was a video that blitzed through social media uh, of a baby that was crying and had his mother's t-shirt put, did you see, how many of you have seen that? Okay, so most of you haven't, so uh, just by chance I have it here. <laughs> Let's watch that, that video now. Don't So we'll give credit to, to USA Today for that. But isn't that interesting? To, to see that, that the mother's smell calmed the baby right down. Uh, is it true that the sense of smell triggers memories more than any other sense? I've heard that to be true. Uh, what smells in your life instantly take you back somewhere? Whether it's good or bad. A uh, couple for me, I, I lived in Hamilton and worked at DeFasco for a short time. And there's something about the smell of being in that factory that will never go away. I, I lived in Virginia Beach right on the ocean for a while. And the smell of the salt air from the ocean. Uh, in, in Virginia Beach, you come through the tunnel and up out of the tunnel and it hits you, that smell. I love that smell. Uh, there's lots of things like that, a campfire or a barbecue. Um, very, very uh, specific smells. The smell of Subway, right? The restaurant, even if you walk into a gas station that has Subway in it, there's a very distinct smell like KFC, right? Now, Subway's smell is very different than the smell in the New York Subway. <laughs> but our smells affect us. And they trigger memories, and, and they make a think so. Now, I wanted to show you that video, partly because it's Mother's Day, and it's a nice, sweet Mother's video. But really, uh, it's just a dumb segue to the, sex, the portion of Scripture that we're going to look at today. And if you have a Bible with you, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, it may help you to have a Bible in your hand today so you can follow along. If you don't have one, if you can get out and get to the back, there's lots there. If you can't get out, just put up your hand. Todd or somebody will bring you a Bible, okay? We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to read that in just a minute, and we're going to talk about those smells. But just kind of find that and put your finger in it and hold on to it for just a second. Because I, I want to give you uh, a little bit of history and background. So last week... We started a new teaching series that will last for the month of May, uh, and Gerald Hogenberg was here. Uh, and, and if you were here, you heard him talk about some pretty fascinating things as a missionary for a long time, right in the Middle East. And he talked about um, the amazing work that God is doing in the Middle East, in, in countries like uh, Beirut and uh, and in Kuwait and Bahrain and the Emirates and Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And one of the things he said is don't believe everything you hear on the news because God is doing amazing things in those countries. Uh, he talked about uh, this is a place where Christianity is being squashed very intentionally all the time, but it is the fastest growing hot spot of Christianity in the whole world. Isn't it funny how sometimes hardship is the best thing that can happen to move things forward? Uh, he talked a little bit about um, how their church was given land, and when they went to find the land, it was like 12 miles from nowhere. And they were given this land, and they built their church, and today the world's largest airport and the world's busiest airport is right next to that land. It's completely surrounded by skyscrapers and people from all over the world are there every single day. He talked about the thousands of people that come, have come to faith in Jesus because of that. He talked about the thousands of Muslims that are turning to Jesus. 
And we never hear about any of that kind of stuff on the news. But, but this is the shining light in dark corners, isn't it? Talk about dark corners of our world. In the next few weeks, I want us to look at that, not necessarily worldwide, but really close to home. Right in your circle, your circle of influence and your friends and your neighbors, and your family, the people that you already have reach and, and relationship with. I want to look at that. And what, what in your reach, not Timbuktu or, or Abu Dhabi, in your reach of influence, where is their darkness and brokenness? And what if, God's plan was for you to be the one who shines light into those dark corners. This is what we want to look at in the next couple of weeks. Um, it comes from Matthew chapter 5. It'll be on the screen. Let me read this. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people put a lamp under a basket, but, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. People see who you are. People see what you are. As people see us and as people interact with you, what are they seeing? What light or darkness is there in a world that's dark and broken. We are to be the light of Christ. We're going to look at it the next couple of weeks through the pen of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. And we're going to specifically look uh, in the next couple of weeks at chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And so feel free over the next few weeks to read those chapters over and over and over. Get really well acquainted with them. Really get to know these passages and what, what Paul is writing here. But, but chapter 1 and chapter 2 together can be pretty confusing. So I want to take just a second, and we'll come back to the smells and, and those kind of things in a second. You'll see why. But I want to give you a little bit of a background on this so that we have the same understanding going into it. Okay, because chapter one, if you read chapter one, you'll just be scratching your head probably. But, but let me give you a little bit of this context. The Apostle Paul had been to visit Corinth. Corinth is in Greece. And he was there about a year and a half and started a church. That, if you want to read that story, it's in Acts chapter 18. And so he started this church. He was there about a, a year and a half. He left to go to other places on his missionary journeys and over a period of time, he got a letter, a report, saying that things were not going very well. The Greek culture was, was kind of creeping in, and the Greek teaching, uh, there was a lot of selfishness. There was people who disagreed with some things that Christ taught, and they were bringing that in. There was some weird behaviors and some selfishness. And so Paul writes a letter back to the church to deal with those specific issues. And in your Bible, that's the letter called 1 Corinthians, all right? So here's what happened. It's hard, and, and he's basically just dealing straight up with problems in the church. And there was a lot of people in the church in Corinth that didn't like what Paul was saying. They didn't like his answers. Maybe they were the ones causing the trouble. Maybe they were just kind of eased into this. But it was hard teaching, and many people turned their back on Paul and what happened out of that was people lashed out and accused him of all kinds of stuff. They accused Paul of mincing words. They accused him of secret live uh, beyond, be underneath the public stuff. They, they, they accused him of, um, uh, of uh, ulterior motives and selfishness behind all of this kind of stuff and just doing it to elevate himself. Um, and, and Paul was really hurt by this. So... Um, Paul visits them again. He go, travels back to Corinth. And this in, um, in chapter 2, in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul calls this the painful visit. And it didn't go well. And it was, it was hard on him and hard on them. 
he leaves and then he writes another letter that's, that he calls the tearful letter. He talks about that in, in 2 Corinthians as well. And then he writes a third letter. So after this visit and then these two other letters trying to make amends and reconcile and understand this, uh, in chapter 1 he says, this caused a lot of pain. But understand, if you're cutting and bleeding about, about this, this is because I love you and want to correct you and let's get things right. Uh, and so uh, after the, the visit and then the two letters, many of the people kind of woke up to the error of their ways and wanted to reconcile with Paul. So then Paul writes a fourth letter. That's the one we have in our Bible that's called 2 Corinthians. It should actually be called 4 Corinthians, but we don't have the other two in our Bibles. So 2 Corinthians is once they've started to want to uh, reconcile with him, he writes this to assure them of, the, of forgiveness and the fact that he loves them and to reestablish some of the core things. And the book really has three chunks to it. I want to look at the first piece and some of these core things that he talks about. He says, let's put all of that pain and all of these issues behind us, and let's be true to him. Let's be true to God. Let's be true to him for the sake of God's kingdom. All right, so, so he says, and let me go through some of that really, really quickly. He said, let's be the aroma of Christ. The aroma of Christ. He says, let's be a love letter from God to people. He says, let's be shining the shining light of the gospel. Let's speak boldly about truth. Let's respectfully persuade people about the truth. He says, uh, this is because God himself has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We're going to talk about that a little bit next week. Paul and the Corinthians were just in the middle of reconciling. And he says, God's given us the ministry of reconciling each other to each other, but also reconciling people to God. And he continues on, and he says, um, instead of judging others, let's see people through God's eyes, not ours. With grace first, let's be ambassadors of Christ. God has given you grace. Be full of grace. Actually, remove barriers between God and people. And then in the end, in chapter 6, he says, and stop all this garbage, all these accusations and the cynicisms and the arguing, and let's live to please God. Now this has everything to do with their relationships within the church. But I think even more, it has everything to do with, with, with our relationships with people outside of faith. And that's kind of what I want to look at over the last next couple of weeks. So when we look at this list, does that help you see where we're going to go the next couple of weeks? Because we're just going to really zero in today on the first two. So if you have your Bible... We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, looking at verse 14 to 15. In my Bible, that's on page 1089, and I'm sure it's not the same for anyone else. Here's what it says. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us into triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. It spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of God. Think about that. Spread the fragrance of the knowledge of God. Paul's mission in life was to, to connect people who don't know God, to connect them to God. And everything he writes is really about this. And he's saying all of this hassle, all of this pain, all of this ugliness isn't helping God's work move forward. So, let's spread the fragrant aroma of God in our world. So, uh, 
where, where's my um, essential oil people? There's a few of you here that have. Oh, like, do you know what a diffuser is? Now, I have a diffuser that that's, sits beside my bed. And you put a little bit of the oil in it and water and turn it on, and it diffuses a mist that sends this, this fragrance through the room, the smell of the oil. It's a diffuser. Interesting, this word here that says spread the fragrance is the word diffuse. What would it look like if you look at your own life today in all the places you go during the week and during the day and all the people that you meet, what if we oversimplified everything in this and just said you are to be a diffuser of who God is in the world that you're in or in the rooms that you're in, in the office, in the workplace, in your home, in your neighborhood, to be a diffuser of that. Tell me, what is the aroma of God that we should be spreading? What, what are characteristics of God? There is, God is love and mercy and grace and joy and peace and generosity. And we can go on and on and on. And, and as you look at your own life, are you a diffuser of that? in your relationships, in your families, at work, in all the places that you go? That's his instruction to us in, in that verse. Verse 15. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. You are the aroma of Christ. Now, I, I, I think I knew what aroma was, but I looked it up in the dictionary anyway. And there's two aspects to uh, what aroma is. Clearly, number one, a distinctive, typically pleasant smell, right? For a baby, the smell of the baby's mother, right, is, is a calming, uh, pleasant smell. But it's also, number two, a subtle, pervasive quality or atmosphere of a, per, of a particular type. A subtle, pervasive quality or atmosphere. When you are around, when you walk into a room, a room, when the phone rings and it's your name that pops up on the call display, how do people respond? What comes to people's minds? Would they, oh, it's him. They run to the phone and get it. Are you that refreshing in people? I think um, we all know people that are like that. We all know people that are the opposite, right? Verse 16, to one, it's a fragrance from death to death. To the other, it's a fragrance from life to life. When people get a whiff of you, when people smell you in that sense, what does it smell like? The scripture says, to some, it's the smell of death. To some, it's the smell of life. And if you know people who are the smell of life, you love being around them. There is life there. They are refreshing. But we all know people who smell like death. And they suck the life out of the room. And I don't want to be around them. When they walk into the room, something changes, right? I remember when we were in Calgary, our uh, optometrist, uh, we were friends with him, and so he gave us this little insight. And when, uh, on, on all the clients, they had files on everybody. And on some of the files, there was a little happy face sticker. You know what that meant? These are the, the grumpy complainers, the ones who, when they walk in the door, you handle them, <laughs> right? Oh, I have something to do in the back room. And the happy face, right? How should we be treating those people? Even knowing, because, but that's, that's all. These are the people that smell like death. They have no life. There's no hope. There's no fun. There's no future. There's no joy. I don't want to answer the phone when, when it shows their name. If they're in at work, uh, it's a day. Uh, maybe I want to work at home today. 
right? You know these kind of people. So if you had the choice, if you had the choice for your own life, let's be the aroma of Christ. I like verse 17. It said, we are not peddlers of God's word. That makes me think we're not the sleazy salesman who's out to, to gain a buck. We're not salesmen about what God is and who God is. If God has truly changed us and lives in us, uh, then, then that changes everything. Instead, look at verse, or chapter 3, verse 2 or 3, 2 and 3. You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on your hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us. You are a love letter. We're not peddlers of God's word. We're, you ought to be a love letter from God to others. Gerald last week when he was speaking, he talked about the, uh, the water bottle he got from our guest welcome center. And how he uses that every morning when he goes to the gym. And if you caught that, he told the story really quick, but there's about 75 people there that he's got to know really well. And next week, those 75 people are coming to over to his house for a barbecue. And just the way he's living his life at the gym every morning is a way of expressing, I'm a love letter from God. The Spirit of the living God is writing a love letter on your heart. Is the Spirit of God writing a love letter in your heart? If somebody looked at you uh, now as opposed to a year ago, can they see that God is writing the script? Are we looking more and more? Are we smelling more and more like Him? Is God more visible and better described by your life? And we're pretty good at reading people, right? What are people reading in us? In this little devotional book that I've been using lately uh, called My Utmost for His Highest, in my daily reading, this was a quote from yesterday. And if you're following me on Facebook, I posted this yesterday. God loved me not because I was lovable, but because it's his nature to do that. Now he commands me to show the same love to others. He's saying, I will bring a number of people around you whom you cannot respect, but you must exhibit my love to them just as I've exhibited to you. That's a big ask, isn't it? Are we sufficient for this? Are we sufficient for this? Are we competent? Are we qualified ourselves? In verse 6, chapter 3, who has made us competent? It says God has made us competent to be ministers of this new covenant. Competent, qualified, me as a man, no. But as we live full of the Spirit of God, this is Jesus come alive in us. Jesus is directing. He is dwelling in you. He's directing you. He's guiding. He's living his life through you. He's leading you. He's empowering you. And Paul continues talking about this over the next few chapters. In chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Live a life where Christ himself is manifested in you. That he's alive in you. That people see Jesus in his life just as I live my life. He talks in chapter 5 about how God's love should be controlling us. And in chapter 5 later that we are ambassadors of Christ. So go back to chapter 2 verse 15. Back to the aroma. You are the aroma of Christ. Now there's two aspects to this as we read the whole chapter. It says right there, you are the aroma of Christ to God. 
when God looks at you, does he smell Jesus? That pro- should probably be our biggest concern. But the second aspect, as we read the rest of the, the chapter, as we've gone through that, it's clearly talking about other people around us too. That we are the aroma of Christ in the lives of other people. And spreading the aroma, a diffuser. First Peter talks about this later. Peter talks about this in his first letter. And he says, uh, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So that when they speak of you as evildoers, they'll see your good works and glorify God. So um, amongst everybody in our world, whether they're believers in Christ or unbelievers, or whether they're close to God or far from God, live your life well in front of them, it says. And even if they falsely accuse you of stuff, be the aroma of Christ in their lives so that they know they're falsely accusing you and really they can see your life. They see what you're doing. They see who you are and God gets glory. Okay, let me wrap it up with this. The diffuser. You're a diffuser. If you're a diffuser of the knowledge of God in your world. I'm not asking you to be a diffuser in Ottawa or in Timbuktu. You're a diffuser where you live in your circle of influence. What does that look like when you go to work tomorrow? What does that look like for those of you who will go to school tomorrow from class to class to class? What would that look like at the coffee shop? And I know there's some of you who go to the coffee shop every single morning and sit with the same group of people every morning. What does that look like if you're a diffuser of the knowledge of God and we take that attitude? When we're at Just Like Moms or we're at Luscious Bakeries or Amici's, you're a diffuser of God's beauty and His love and His grace. Maybe, what does it look like at the dinner table? To be the aroma of Christ and the diffuser of that. So we talked about smells at the very beginning. And we had a video about the baby. Smells trigger memory. Probably or more, probably as much or more than anything else. Smells trigger memory. But smells also trigger emotion. And smells trigger connection. So how do we, as the aroma of Christ, how do we trigger connection with God to the people around us? Do you smell like Jesus? Or do you smell like death? I want to show you one last video. And this is uh, a Mother's Day video, and it's about mothers and, and, and all of the things that, that a mother is in their family. But I want you to draw the really obvious connection to what we're talking about. Because if we're living this way, if we're living as the aroma of Christ, as a diffuser of who God is, then all of these things in the video are true about all of us. Okay? So when we watch the video, let's draw that obvious conclusion. 